Women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but only 20% of its leadership. On Her Story, we'll explore the careers of bold and influential women from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill and learn how they've overcome the odds. I'm your host, Sandra Jane, and this is Her Story, a program where we explore what's beyond the glass ceiling. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Sheikha Jane, the founder and chair of the Women in Medicine Summit, also known as WIMS for short. Dr. Jane wears several hats, including assistant professor of medicine at the University of Illinois uh, Cancer Center in Chicago, and I'll let her share more of her accolades shortly. Sheikha, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. Yeah, and we're really looking forward to working with WIMS on this exciting series that we'll uh, talk more about in a minute. But let's start with your background for a minute. What inspired your interest in medicine? I actually grew up in a physician household. My dad is a vascular surgeon, and I always actually thought I was going to be either a surgeon or a pediatrician. So obviously I didn't go either of those routes. Uh, But my parents both told me from the time I was very little that if I wanted to be a doctor, that I needed to love it because it wasn't just a job. It was really where I would be spending the majority of my time. It was where I would be spending a lot of time studying, and it took a lot of hard work and effort to get there. But if I loved it, if I loved medicine, if I loved Love science, if I wanted to work with people, then I should absolutely pursue pursue my dreams. And I knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a physician. I used to round with my dad in the hospital on the weekends, and I just loved that patient interaction. Even as a surgeon, um, I know a lot of times you assume surgeons go in, they do the surgery, and they never see the patient again. My dad had a lot of really great long-term relationships with his patients. We would run into them in the grocery store, and they would remember him, and he would remember them from you know 20 years earlier. And I liked that interpersonal uh, relationship that he would have with his patients. And then as I got older, I realized the science, the pathophysiology, uh, all of the really interesting things about the fact that I would constantly be learning, all of that lent itself to me realizing that medicine is where I really found my passion and where I wanted to focus my career. That's great. So then you said you're originally thinking pediatrics or surgery. How did you find your path into hematology and oncology? Well, when I did my pediatrics rotation, I realized I love children, but I could not take care of sick children because it just hurt my heart too much, made me feel too bad, and I felt bad for the parents, and it was just something where I knew emotionally I would have a really tough time uh, seeing sick kids day in and day out. So I knew I loved children in general, but I don't think that I had the personality or the ability to separate myself from sick children and then my own personal mental health. Uh, And then for surgery, I loved surgery. I absolutely loved my surgery rotations. I really enjoyed it. I actually rotated with my dad, which was very cool. Um, But I realized at the end of the day that for me, I wanted to not only be able to have those long-term relationships with my patients, I also wanted to have the opportunity to practice medicine in a variety of different ways, which surgery is a phenomenal specialty. And I have a lot of amazing colleagues and friends who went into that into those specialties and I realized that for me I really wanted to have the internal medicine background I wanted to practice medicine in the clinic and I as much as I loved procedures I really liked the diagnosis and the treatment aspect Um, and so for me internal medicine seemed like the way to go then after that when I was a resident I did my hemonc rotations and I just I just fell in love with oncology the patient relationships that I saw, the way that um, patients and their families really develop long-term relationships with their physicians and you know the doctors that I worked with knew about grandkids that were coming or knew about graduations and <clears throat> excuse me there was the opportunity to really have um, a long-term relationship with patients and then those patients who may not have necessarily made it uh, made it past the first couple of months you have the ability to help them navigate into really Uh, hard conversations, having palliative care and hospice discussions, um, helping people navigate a time in their life that is really, really challenging. So the passion for what you do is just so apparent. And not only are you a phenomenal frontline clinician working with patients, but you also hold several different leadership roles. I mean, you are, I don't know when you sleep, but one of the questions we love to ask all of our guests is, do you consider your foray into healthcare leadership more accidental or intentional? 
I would say probably both accidental and intentional. If six years ago you had told me that I would be doing the work that I'm doing now, I would probably have laughed because this is not where I saw my time being spent six years ago. As a trainee, I never really imagined that I would go into healthcare communication or equity work. Um, so I, I think that there was definitely a point in my career when I realized, huh, I have a, I have a skill set that is unique and might actually be able to move the needle in several different arenas. And so I started focusing a lot of my attention on those, in those spaces without even realizing I was doing it. And that helped me navigate a path into leadership that, again, I don't necessarily think I had envisioned would be my, my path forward. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, underlying your interest areas in communication and health equity, and one of the reasons we're here to, to chat today is around this idea of women in leadership and women in medicine. And so I'm curious, at what point in your career did you begin to kind of realize that the path for you as a female physician and a female leader was going to be different? Well, it's so funny because I grew up, like I said, in a house with a physician father. Um, and I was always taught from the time I was really little that everyone should be treated equally and equitably. So there was never a division between me and my brother. It was, we both did the same things. We were treated the same. We did the same sports. You know, we excelled in whatever we excelled in. My parents didn't ever say, you're a girl, you do this. He's a boy, he does this. It was just assumed in my house that boys and girls did what they wanted and exceeded in expectations in different uh, sports and different uh, academic pursuits, but there was never that gender divide. So I just assumed that's how life was because that's how I was raised and that's how I lived my life. As I traversed through medical school, residency, fellowship, I started to note some things that were happening that I didn't think seemed particularly fair or right, not just to me, but to some of my colleagues. But a lot of times I looked internally because another thing my parents always taught me was when there is a problem or when you don't succeed at something, figure out what you need to do to improve yourself because you can't improve others. You can't change other people's behaviors. You can only change your own. So anytime something would happen, I would look internally and say, how could I have done that differently? How could I have navigated that situation differently? And so a lot of things that happened, I just assumed I needed to be better. I needed to do something different. When I became an attending, I started talking to other women physicians, and I realized a lot of things that had happened to me had also happened to other people. So it wasn't actually something that was wrong with me or something that I needed to fix. They were actually systemic issues and barriers that existed that put up these these guard or put up these these barriers to, to my success and my ability to do things. And I started to understand a bit more about implicit bias and how it really impacted and influences the way people interact with everyone. And so when I started talking to these other women and realized some of these barriers that existed shouldn't be there, and I was naive to a certain extent because I really thought that it was just me that needed to improve, I started to realize that there were ways to improve upon the system, but it would require intentionality, it would require a team effort, and it would require leadership. And so that's when I started to think about this Women in Medicine Summit and how could I create a community where women get together and and don't complain about the issue because I don't think there's much use in saying, well, this is a problem and this is a problem. I think the utility is coming together and saying, these are the problems that exist and here are solutions. Now, how do we de deploy these solutions across the country? And so the summit was developed to educate people who attended. You know, it's a CME, Continuing Medical Education Conference. So I wanted to make sure there was an educational component based in science and evidence and fact. But I also wanted to create these networks and these communities of women across the country um, across silos, across institutions, academic community, uh, across specialties, because we all face very similar challenges. And through the summit, what we found is people come and they learn, but even more than that, they develop really strong relationships with other people that they meet at the conference. And there's actually been amazing opportunities that have come out of it. I've seen people who have gotten promotion letters. I've seen people who've been invited to give talks, people who've... Uh, found other people who can help them figure out how to negotiate for their jobs, people who've actually started advocacy programs within their own organizations or institutions. And so we're seeing slowly, slowly chipping away these systemic barriers that exist because 
people who think the problem is them are now realizing the problem isn't exactly them. The problem is exactly the system and they need to figure out how, how to fix that. And so it's a really cool opportunity and experience for me to see all of these incredible women who have faced challenges across the country now come together and come up with solutions together as to how each of their organizations and institutions can address these problems. Wow. First of all, I mean, congratulations on that. I know you've been working at this for a couple of years now, but the work that you have, have led is just really so inspiring. And so, you know, you make it sound really easy, but take us back to, you know, as you were going through training, you know, seeing these systemic issues, what was it that made you say, well, you know, I'm actually on top of my day job and the many other hats that you wear, you know, hosting your own podcast and teaching and seeing patients. I mean, that you were going to actually form an official nonprofit around this and have another full-time job. I mean, what was that kind of decision-making process like for you? So I will tell you that when I was a trainee, I was not focused on anything other than getting through my fellowship, passing my boards, making sure I was an exceptional doctor. Those are things that I, these types of things, I don't actually think I got really involved in until after I became full-fledged faculty, after I passed my boards and I knew that I knew my stuff when it came to hematology and oncology. I will say I'm so impressed with many medical students, residents, fellows today who are doing all this incredible work on the side. I can't even imagine being able to navigate my career as a trainee and doing all of this work. So hats off to all the amazing women and men who are doing this work right now early, very early in their careers. For me, I still have many days where I wonder what on earth am I doing? Why am I doing this? It takes so much time. I don't have time for this. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm not, you know, people always joke that you can do one or two things very well per day and you have to choose them. I often feel like I'm not doing anything well on a certain day and I have to just come to terms with the fact that I'm not going to be perfect and I'm going to make mistakes and uh, there's going to be missteps along the way. I also think it's important for people to remember everyone's not going to support you. Everyone is not going to agree with what you're doing. I've had many people tell me that what I'm doing is a uh, career ending. I've had people tell me that I'm not a true academic. I've had people tell me that I'm not a true leader because the work that I'm doing doesn't matter. Um, so I've had a lot of naysayers along the way. And, and when you hear something like that enough times, it does start to chip away at your confidence and chip away at, at your desire to do these types of things. So I've been there and I, I still am there on many days. Uh, I am very fortunate in that I have a very strong support system. I have amazing supportive parents who I've mentioned. My uh, husband is very supportive. I have a brother who's very supportive. And I have three kids who are young, but they understand sometimes what mommy needs to be doing. So I think that's been the way I've been able to navigate through this and that I have that core group of supportive individuals who I know have my back. But it was not easy. And even when I was forming this at, at its infancy, there was a lot of pushback. I was young and I had a lot of senior people telling me I was not the right person to be doing this. I should not be leading this initiative. I should not be the one who uh, is creating this type of programming because I was too young. Um, I had one person tell me I shouldn't be creating it because I was a woman. And I said, but the programming is for women and men because we now have allyship training as well. Um, but I've, I've heard all sorts of things. I've had people tell me I should be focusing more on my family, uh, that I'm not gonna be a good mom because of this, that I'm not gonna be a good partner or wife because of this. And so, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge for me is, is making sure I'm filtering out the negative and focusing on the positive. And I will say sometimes I do use the negative to try to figure out how I can be better because I do still very much believe that you can always be improving upon what you're doing and improving upon yourself. So I don't just brush off all the negativity as, oh, they don't understand. I oftentimes listen to those negative or constructive comments and say, okay, is there any truth to what they're saying? How can I use that to improve what we're doing? My family ha are my biggest critics when it comes to making sure that I am doing things uh, intentionally. Um, they also are really good at helping me refocus. I'll give you a perfect example. This last year and a half with the pandemic has been a huge struggle for healthcare workers across the country. And I went through a period of time where I was probably working 18 to 20 hours a day. I wasn't sleeping. I was on my phone all the time and I wasn't paying attention to my kids or my family and my kids were starting to notice it. And so my daughter said to me one day, mommy, get off your phone. 
And I tried to explain, I mean, she's seven. So I tried to explain to her, mommy's doing something really important. And then I thought to myself, but is what I'm doing right this second so important that I can't sit down and play with my daughter for, you know, half an hour? I only get a couple of hours with them a day. Can this wait until later? Or is this something I need to do at all? So one thing that, you know, my, my family has been really good about is telling me, you know, your work is really important. The stuff you're doing is really important, but you only get these moments with your family for such a short period of time. Try to find a better way to balance, which we all know balance doesn't exist. But what I've been trying to do now is I've been trying to be very intentional in saying no to certain things or realizing that there are certain things other people can handle. I don't need to be doing everything. Um, I can delegate or something can wait till the next day. Not everything is an emergency, but the pandemic has had made it very hard for me to, to find that balance. And I'm now hopefully starting to improve upon balancing my home life and my work life a little bit better or integrating it, I guess you could say. That's phenomenal perspective. And, you know, just building on that, I mean, it's a common um, issue that, that many women and women physicians in particular have to juggle. And so I'm curious, you know, you mentioned your kids. So I know you have three kids and they're, and they're quite young and you have a spouse who's also a practicing clinician. What advice would you have, particularly for um, women physicians who are kind of juggling the unpredictable nature of clinical practice with kind of the household and home family responsibilities? Before we started recording, I was telling you how our nanny called in sick today and I have clinic and I had all these meetings and, you know, it was, it's, it's difficult. It's super hard and I don't want to minimize that. And again, I am very fortunate because I have family in the area who can sometimes help, although today they're not available to help. But I think that it's really important to build your support system. I have some very close friends. You know, one of my my daughters going to our neighbor's house today. Um, she said, I, I heard this is happening. Can I help? Can I, you know, she's a part of our bubble. So she said, you know, I know you, th you don't have many options. You can't really drop her off with other people. We're in your bubble. Would do you want to drop her off here? So having that support system, whether it's family or friends, is so, so important because you're going to need help. You can't do this by yourself yourself. I tell everybody who, uh, who listens to me that I would not be able to do 99% of the things that I do without my support system. Um, even on days when, like today, when I'm scrambling to try to find childcare or figure out how, you know, how somebody's going to pick up my kids from camp or school or, or make sure that they're safe with the pandemic and they're wearing masks, I know that I have a trusted group of people who I can rely on, who I can go to and ask for help. And I think that is so important. We are very bad in general for asking for help. We assume we're supposed to be able to do everything ourselves. And a lot of times we take it as a failure if we need to ask for help. And I will say that it is not a failure. It's actually the sign of an excellent leader who can ask for help when they realize they need it. And that that's not just for home and family life. When it comes to the Women in Medicine Summit, I oftentimes do not know how to do certain things because I don't know everything. There's a lot I don't know. So I make sure that my team is made up of a lot of people who have skills that I don't have, who have backgrounds and knowledge that I do not have. And sometimes those are people who are younger than me. I have medical students who I have in leadership positions within the summit because I very much believe in bi-directional mentorship and bi-directional leadership where you might have a medical student who is an expert on Instagram and they can actually teach a bunch of the faculty on how to have a social media campaign. Last year, the Women in Medicine Summit in 24 or in 48 hours had 40, I think it was 45 million impressions on, on Twitter in the 48 hours of the conference. And I 100% attribute that to our medical students. We had a phenomenal team of students who were leading the social media effort and I think that they're one of the biggest reasons why we were so successful when it comes to our reach. So I think that asking for help and finding where your own gaps are, whether it's educational gaps or skill sets or just gaps in childcare, finding out where your gaps are and then finding a supportive group of people who can help you with those, I think is so key, whether it's in your work life or your home life. That's such a good reminder. And I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but I know you have many superpowers, but in just listening to you talk, I think one of your strengths really is this idea of drawing connections and you know connecting the dots between people to build those relationships and support systems. And I think that's a great transition 
transition to what we're doing together too between her story and whims is how do you start bridging the gaps and you know build a broader community and bring people together to have tackle some of these systemic issues and so you know the the whims conference for this year is coming up in just a couple of weeks and would love to hear from you a little bit about what your vision is for this year in terms of the areas of focus. And I know one of the themes is finding your voice. What inspired that? So to start to answer about how kind of making those connections have happened, I think that it's really important to look for people outside your circles. I think that finding heterogeneous people with heterogeneous skills. So for example, at the summit, we have non-physicians who are speaking. We have lawyers, we have health policy people, we have media personalities. And I do that specifically because I think that in medicine, especially, we are really siloed and we very much have tunnel vision when it comes to our jobs and our careers. And it's because that's how people become successful in healthcare. You get through med school residency and potentially fellowship and you have to have tunnel vision to be successful. But I think there is a real detriment to our healthcare system when we don't look outside of our groups of, uh, of interest. And so I've tried really hard to look for people outside of my circle. And I do that by reaching out to people who I wouldn't normally reach out to. Uh, it has been amazing the things that I've learned from some of these women and men across the country. We have these two men who are PhDs leading our allyship leadership, uh, long, longitudinal leadership program. And I met them at a conference I went to and I said, you guys are incredible. I want to do something with you. And we couldn't figure out what it was initially. And then two years later, I came up with this idea for this longitudinal program and I asked them to lead it. I never would have had the opportunity to do that if I hadn't just stepped outside of my comfort zone and introduced myself to them. So I think that's a really big thing when it comes to making those connections and connecting people across uh, across the silos is reaching out to people who would not normally be in your circle. When it comes to the summit this year, uh, when we talk about finding your voice, one big thing that happened over the last year and a half is we have seen a flood of healthcare workers' voices in the media, on social, on social media, um, in publications, just talking about the pandemic and how it's impacted their, them, how it's impacted their families, and how it's impacted their patients. And the thing that I think is so phenomenal is that many of these healthcare workers are burning the candle at both ends. They're exhausted. They're so tired. And they're taking whatever extra time they have, and they're using their voices to educate and attack this misinformation that's all over the place these days. And there's a lot of physicians who've come to me and said, I don't know how to use my voice. I have all these things to say, but I don't know how to get myself out there. And I remember six years ago, I had posted in a couple of Facebook groups saying, I really want to lecture nationally because I like public speaking and I feel like I, I have a knack for, for communication, but I don't know how to, how to break in. And there wasn't really a great way to navigate that path, to find my voice and figure out how to get into those, those, those segments of, of healthcare communication. And I kind of navigated on my own with, I have a couple of phenomenal mentors who have helped me um, find my voice. And I think that a lot of people don't have that mentorship or sponsorship. So the theme for this year of finding your voice really came from how can we help all of these amazing women and men find their voices and then use their voices to educate or do community outreach or do advocacy work, do things that are going to help improve the system because it's not just gender inequities that are impacting our system. There's structural racism that is a huge problem in our society in general, but it has been really laid bare in the last year and a half in the healthcare system as well. So the concept of finding your voice really came from seeing all these incredible healthcare workers putting their voices out there over the last year and a half and having people reach out to me asking, how do I do that? So a lot of our talks this year are really about navigating a path to leadership, but then also using your voice to be most effective, whether you have a leadership position or not. Um, I do a lot of talks on informal versus formal leadership, and this goes back to you know me trying to lift up medical students and trainees and other early career women physicians to try to help them find their voice early on. I think that there's a lot of informal leaders out there who just haven't had the platform yet to lead. And so I try really hard myself to lift those, lift those people up, and I'm hoping that the summit provides the ability to do that as well. 
we're actually launching a speakers bureau this fall that I'm hoping will become kind of the white pages of women in medicine speakers. And it's going to be open to women across the country. And the hope is that we get women experts at all levels of their career. And I think a lot of focus in healthcare has always been on seniority and on people who've been in the job for a while, who have certain types of experiences. But I think the way healthcare is going, we really need to bring to the table some of these younger, more innovative people who might have unique ideas based on their own life experiences and really almost because of their generation and because how they grew up. I mean, many people in leadership did not grow up with internet. They learned about it as adults. And so having people who grew up with internet and being on their phones 24 seven, I think it's important to, to incorporate those types of people into leadership positions. And so we're working really hard with the summit and all of our initiatives to bring to the forefront some of these amazing women who are doing incredible work, but aren't necessarily getting the recognition for it. That's very well said. I mean, as you know, with her story, we have a similar philosophy where it's, you know, the definition of a leader is, you know, it's so varied and it's all about influence. And so whether it's a formal title or not, or, you know, have you made it however many years of experience that you have. And so I think bringing these voices to the table and kind of learning from each other is such an important kind of piece to this. You know, one of the things what we're trying to do with her story is to really highlight the different leadership paths and career trajectories, particularly with this collaboration together on on paths in medicine. Because to your point and even your story, you know, you can start off, you know, at the bedside, but there are so many different ways to leverage that influence and perspective and subject matter expertise in different niches of the healthcare industry. And so you have um, helped us put together an incredible lineup of three uh, physician uh, female leaders in the industry um, who have some very unique stories and different uh, career roles. Tell us a little bit about kind of what we can expect in this series on kind of um, what we can learn from their stories. I am so excited for the people you were interviewing. The three women that you're going to be interviewing are just phenomenal. I mean, they are rock stars, superstars. I don't even know how many adjectives I could use to describe them. Um, you have Dr. Vinnie Aurora, who is the uh, yeah, the Dean of Medical Education at the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago, and she's also a dear friend of mine. Um, she's one of my mentors and colleagues and sponsors and just amazing all-around human. Um, I think that she is so unique because she has really navigated a path to leadership that is different from most other paths that I've seen. I joke with her that she is a dean unlike any other because she has done so much of her work in the social media space, in the medical education space, and in the advocacy space. And those three components are not typically what you imagine when you're imagining someone who's navigating a path to a dean position at a very, very high tier institution like the University of Chicago. So she has the opportunity and she's already started doing it where she is changing the culture at the institution by putting a focus on advocacy work and how important that is, by providing education to students at a very young young uh, age at the beginning of their careers to learn how to not only be an advocate for themselves, but also how to be advocates for their patients and their communities. I think that her style of teaching and mentorship is so unique and innovative that she is just going to be an amazing dean. And she's really going to change, in my opinion, the path of healthcare, not only in her own institution, but nationally. She's just, she's a superstar. Dr. Kimberly Manning, I actually met, I say met because we've never actually met in person, but I met virtually during the pandemic. I had been an avid uh, fangirl of hers on social media. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> she um, was actually invited to speak at last year at the Women in Medicine uh, White Coats for Black Lives virtual march that we had planned in, uh, in partnership with uh, the other group that I run, Impact. And the plan was to do a virtual march. And we had a couple, I think over 100 people who were in attendance. And she, we started talking and the event was Zoom bombed. And it was a very traumatizing and horrifying experience for all of us. But we shut down the march and recorded a few minutes later 
uh, Dr. Manning's speech that she was going to give. And we posted it online and it ended up getting over a million views within, I think, a day. Um, and then Dr. Manning, Dr. Aurora, and myself wrote a piece for the New England Journal of Medicine that was published soon after. And so she is now, I consider her a dear friend, although we've never met in person. Um, we've collaborated quite a bit over the last year. And she is such a powerful voice, whether it's through narrative medicine, telling uh, stories on Twitter about healthcare education and how to really break down the barriers with patients and, and have open and honest communications and dialogues, to going on BET and doing, you know, COVID education. I mean, she she is really one of a kind, and I am so excited to hear her episode because she's just she's just again another phenomenal woman leader. Dr. Stephanie Hartzell is someone I met relatively recently, again virtually because I haven't met anybody new during the pandemic uh, in person. And she is also extremely unique in that she does a lot of work with the media, looking at uh, consulting for uh, companies like Netflix on medical TV shows and providing more accurate ways to to um, represent the healthcare system and doctors and nurses. She also does a lot of work um, in. Uh, in adolescent psychiatry. And the thing that I think is so amazing about her, along with everything else I mentioned, she actually gave a webinar as one of our WIMS webinar series talking about how you can be, uh, I think it's how you can be anything without having to be everything. So many physicians are perfectionists, especially women in medicine. Um, we always make the joke that if there's 10 things that you have to fulfill to, to get a job, women will try to fulfill 15 of them before they even apply. So she gives an excellent talk on um, on how to be anything without being everything and how really focusing on what your goals are um, can help you become more successful as opposed to stretching yourself so thin. So she's phenomenal. And all three of these women are going to be speaking at this year's summit as well. Um, Dr. Manning and Dr. Aurora have spoken last year, and uh, this is Dr. Hartzell's first year speaking at the summit. But all three of them are just phenomenal, dynamic, powerhouse women in medicine. Well, we're really excited to share their stories. And to your point, it's really just the tip of the iceberg of the phenomenal uh, different women and, and men that are going to be sharing their stories at the summit coming up. So delighted to be working with you all on that. So I guess just rounding us out then, you know, coming back a little bit to your story, I mean, you have just built a, this incredible platform and community and the power of which, you know, I am learning more and more of, of it every day. So thank you for doing that. As you think about your career and the many more chapters that you have to write in your autobiography, because I know there's more coming, what would be the title of your book? You know, that is such a hard question because... <laughs> Uh, people ask me, what are you going to be doing in five years? And I tell them, if you told me five years ago, I'd be doing this, I would have laughed. So it's really hard for me to say, but I think probably if I had to choose a title right now, it would be expect the unexpected because a lot of people underestimate me. And I've, I've experienced that throughout my life where I've had, like I said, I've had a lot of people tell me that I wasn't going to be a doctor, that I wasn't going to be successful, that um, I didn't know what I was doing, that I was focusing on the wrong things. And so I, I think I've surprised some people in what I've been able to accomplish. But again, I haven't been able to do it without an amazing support system and team. So it's not just me. I, I wouldn't be able to do this without all those other people. Um, and then also expecting the unexpected because I don't know where my career is going to take me. I don't know what I'll be doing in five years. So I think that would probably be the autobiography title for now. But ask me in a year and I'll probably be something different. We'll hold you to that. So we'll have you back in a year and we'll, we'll see how it's going. <laughs> Shiga, this has just been phenomenal. We're really excited to be launching this Her Story Whims uh, special series together and looking forward to working with you in the years to come. Thanks so much for having me and I'm so excited for this partnership and moving forward together. 